Hello, good evening everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the programme manager for the European reference network that we call Eurogen that deals with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. Um, just before we get started, I think it's helpful to explain a little bit about what a European reference network is and does. There are 24 European reference networks which were created and but they're funded by the European Commission and they all started work in 2017. And they all collaborate to give highly specialised advice for patients with rare diseases. So our aim as a network is to deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions who all need highly specialised surgery. So it's where the expertise is rare, really. So what do we do? Well, as a network, we're now 57 hospitals in 20 member states, and we deliver virtual consultations, as you saw from the slides at the beginning, we can um, gather together our experts in the different hospitals and have a secure web-based virtual consultation and give advice to any healthcare professional who needs it or would like it across the EU. Um, we also do training and education activities and we also have a Eurogen patient registry that's just being rolled out across our hospitals. And that's really exciting because, as you'll all know, one of the problems with patients with rare diseases is a fragmented uh, data set. Uh, the data is, is really lacking. So the idea is that if we all collect the data across the 57 hospitals, then very quickly we should have a, a much more solid base of information with which, for example, to feed into our uh, development of clinical guidelines, which is another activity of the networks. So uh, that's what we do. And today's webinar is about the therapeutic alternatives in paediatric kidney transplantations. And the presenter is Professor Maria Jose Martinez Urita, and she's a paediatric urologist from the University Children's Hospital at La Paz in Madrid. And uh, we're very happy that they're one of our members in the network. Um, unfortunately, um, Professor um, Martinez can't be with us uh, to answer questions, but we're really delighted that her colleague, Dr. Virginia Amesty, who is also a paediatric urologist, and of course, she's another valuable member of the transplant team at La Paz. So uh, thank you very much, Virginia, for stepping in and answering all the questions at the end. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, thank you very much, and we'll start the presentation now. Dear college, it's an honor and a privilege to share with you some of the most important aspects of renal transplantation in children. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Maria Martinez Urrutia, pediatric urologist. I'm part of the Pediatric Renal Transplant Team at University Hospital La Paz in Madrid, Spain. Spain is located in South Europe with Madrid as its capital. La Paz Children's Hospital has gained experience from 540 renal transplants and 163 were from living donors. Renal transplantation is without doubt the treatment of choice for children with any stage renal disease, but it's not a definitive cure. It is probable that the child will need more than one kidney transplant throughout life. On this topic, and due to their significant impact on grad survival, we are going to include the following section. First, Renal transplant performed with grafts from younger donor. Second, the impact of laparoscopy like donor nephrectomy. Third, the need to place inverted kidney for anatomical reasons. Fourth, the surgical strategy for kidney transplantation with an oversized kidney in a small recipient. 
fish, many of the problems that damage native kidneys, particularly bladder dysfunction, could also damage the transplanted kidney if they are not adequately treated. And sixth, inferior vena cava thrombosis in a pediatric defector can endanger renal transplant results and even necessitate changing the surgical protocol. Most renal transplantation in pediatric or adult patients are performed with organs from cadaveric donors. Grass survival of pediatric donor kidneys is lower than for adult donor kidneys. The deficit of cadaveric organs to cover the demand for renal transplantation in children has led us to widen the acceptable criteria for grafts from cadaveric donors. Donors under three years of age are potential source to increase the number of renal transplants and alleviate the existing demand. But if the number of donor glomeruli is too small to filter the recipient blood volume, the graft adapts to the recipient weight by hyperfiltration. The receptor of the single pediatric graft under three years of age frequently has hypertension, proteinuria, and a progressive worsening of the graft function. By doubling the transplanted renal mass, we hope to avoid hyperfiltration injuries and thereby increase resistance to rejection. In blood transplantations from pediatric donors under three years of age, mostly placed in adults, have been excellent results. Survival of this graft is similar to single kidney from older donors. However, in blood transplantation has a higher incidence of graft thrombosis, torsion of one of the kidney, and urological complications. A double renal transplantation with simultaneous unilateral implantation, both graft in the same iliac fossa, or bilateral implantation, a kidney in each iliac fossa, provide sufficient renal mass to improve the survival curve and avoid the technical problem related with the en bloc technique. That surgical technique is similar to that of single kidney transplantation with extraperitoneal approach. Both kidneys are sequentially placed in the same iliac fossa. The right kidney is grafted in a superior position, performing entusiastic anastomosis of the renal artery to aorta or to the common iliac artery, and the renal vein to the inferior vena cava or to the common iliac vein. When the anastomoses are complete, the clamps will be removed and the first graft will be revascularized and we proceed to place the second graft. The left kidney is caudal to the first kidney with an end-to-side anastomosis of the graft vessels to the common or external iliac vessels. The ureters are spatulated into a shotgun barrel and implanted into the bladder using an extravesical technique. This survival core shows that it's a good option for older pediatric receptors in red survival from double transplant and in black single transplant. Kidney transplantation from living donor is commonly performed all over the world, but its incidence is variable. USA, UK, Italy, and Denmark have a high rate of living donor kidney transplants. About 10% of kidney transplants performed in Spain are with a living donor. The main advantage of doing kidney transplantation with living donors are minimum cold ischemia time, 
good histocompatibility in living related donor, it is possible to do peridialysis transplant and the graft survival is better. Laparoscopy is an attractive alternative to open surgery in donor nephrectomy harvesting. Laparoscopy donor nephrectomy results in a significant decrease postoperative patient morbidity and shorter recovery. Thanks to laparoscopy nephrectomy, the number of living donors transplant in pediatric recipient has increased. Despite the possible side effect due to pneumoperitoneum and longer war ischemia time, it is a safe procedure with an outcome similar to those with an open nephrectomy. And it's the standard technique in many transplant centers. This table shows the comparative outcome in recipient of lab an open donor nephrectomy allograft. All kidneys were successfully transplanted. The decreasing percentage of serum creatinine during the first 24 hours post-transplant was slower in the laparoscopy group compared with open donor nephrectomy. Therefore, laparoscopy group need more days to reach the minimum serum creatinine levels, actually 9.5. These differences disappear one week after transplant and GFR did not show any more difference between the two groups after two years. Although, as you can see, GFR at once six and 12 months for transplant was even higher in the laparoscopic group. Although outcomes of renal transplant in children have improved in recent decades, there are many factors that can affect the graft survival. Call ischemia time, intra and post-operative hemodynamic support, and some technical aspects are recognized as variable that can improve graph survival. We are not always going to have the ideal organ. A kidney graph with very short artery or vein, a pedicle with multiple vessels, or anatomical anormalities in the recipient are circumstances which may pose technical difficulties when performing a vascular anastomosis. In some of these instances, Reversing the pulse of the kidney may improve its accommodation and facilitate vascular anastomosis. Laparoscopy make it more difficult to achieve adequate vessel length, especially with the renal vein. Anatomical anormalities in the recipients are shown in these patients. Inverted placement of the kidney graft may be helpful. She received a kidney transplant at 14 years old. Upside down kidney placement requires living a longer ureter. And in addition, the proximal ureter describes a curve that can bend and make it difficult to enter the pierureteral junction. Mobilization of the proximal ureter in the renal ileum have sometimes been used to prevent the fourth core of the proximal ureter in the upside down graft position. This maneuver is not exempt from risk since it can affect the vascularization of the ureter and cause its necrosis. Prenatal diagnosis and neonatal care have improved the survival of children with severe genitourinary malformation who develop end stage renal disease in the first months of life. This fact has the consequence of increasing the number of patients who need a kidney transplant at early age. Although side kidneys 
are an alternative to the limitation of donors, especially in pediatric patients where parents and relatives are usually volunteers for living donation. However, the use of other side kidneys in small recipients have a higher risk of graft thrombosis due to vessel disparity, as well as the risk of graft hypoperfusion and abdominal work closure difficulties. Risk of thrombosis to mismatched anastomosis can be solved by implanting the adult kidney to large vessels such as the aorta or the common iliac artery and the inferior vena cava. Other strategy has been described like a special microanastomosis technique to increase the circumference of the small vessels. Also, retrocava arterial anastomosis to avoid compression from the artery on the cava when it's anastomosed to the aorta. The discrepancy inside between the adult donor kidney and the recipient's abdominal cavity may lead to compartment syndrome with abdominal wall closure. The increase in abdominal pressure can collapse the inferior vena cava and hinder the venous return of the craft and even thrombosis. The placement of agoretes mesh allows progressive closure of the abdominal wall. Many of the problems that damage native kidney, particularly bladder dysfunction, will also damage the transplanted kidney if they are not treated adequately. Patients with poor compliance bladder must be treated with anticholinergic drugs and or bladder augmentation to create a low pressure and compliant reservoir that will protect the eventual renal allograft. We recommend performing this prior to transplantation. If the patient has a very dilated ureter, it is possible to do an ureterocystoplasty. We will do bladder augmentation with interesting if there is not dilated urinary tract. Gastrocystoplasty is not recommended because of serious potential complication due to the presence of gastric tissue in the bladder of an anuric patient. If the patient is unable to empty the bladder adequately, an urethral catheterization is not possible, a mitrofanor procedure is performed. All patients, and especially in those with several central catheters, will tumor or previous transplant must be screened with ultrasound for vena cava thrombosis. Children with end-stage renal disease and inferior vena cava thrombosis or mild aortic syndrome are infrequent. But they are conditioned present one of the most challenging clinical situation for a pediatric transplant team. If the ultrasound reveals a vena cava thrombosis, venography must be done to evaluate the venous anatomy and determine where a fissure graft can be placed. The most appropriate donor, other side rather, a pediatric kidney, and the site of the renal vein anastomosis should be individualized and tailored to both the recipient venous anatomy and to his to her condition. In this patient, the venography reveals a native left renal vein. An orthotopic renal transplant with living donor was performed after native nephrectomy. To sum up, a double renal transplant for a donor under three years old provides sufficient renal mass to obtain adequate renal function. Therefore, 
it is an appropriate option for older pediatric receptor. The laparoscopy light -like donor nephrectomy at COM is similar to those with open nephrectomy and is a safe procedure. The inversion of the pulse of the kidney is a valid and safe option in pediatric renal transplantation when there are technical difficulties caused by the characteristic of either the graft or the recipient. Other side kidney transplant in the small pediatric recipient is both logistically and technically challenging. The surgeon may need to modify the approach, vessels anatomosis, and abdominal wall closure. In patients with bladder dysfunction, pretransplant evaluation and surgical management are necessary to plan the construction of adequate urinary reservoir with good capacity, compliance, and emptying before the kidney transplant. In patients with previous inferior vena cava thrombosis, an orthotopic renal transplant should be considered. As we can see, the pediatric renal transplantation has an exciting and promising future. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, that ends the presentation. Um, so we'll ask now if anybody has questions, um, please send them in now. Um, we'll give it a few minutes while people do that. Um, Virginia, have you put yet? There you go. So stop sharing the video screen as well. Um, okay. Do you have a minimum weight of, of or age for living related transplant in, in a children? Yes, we we usually use a minimum of 10 kilograms in the patient, and not only the age, but also the most important fact is the is the weight. So our minimum it's 10 kilograms. Uh, we we prefer not to do it in a small uh, smaller kits because the the vas are very 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 small. Um, that's our limit. And sometimes we also consider the the diameter of the vas. And, uh, um, and sometimes uh, 10 uh, kilograms in, in some, some children with 10 kilograms could have uh, some very, very, very small vessels. In, in some cases, we wait for the kid to grow a little bit more and then perform the transplantation. There is another question here. Do you have a workup protocol for kidney transplant? Um, mm, what do you mean a workup protocol? We have protocols, yeah, but um, I don't know what you mean with a workup protocol. If you can um, uh, specify, but um, I can I can help you with the, with this question. Yeah, okay. I'll give Pim a second just to uh, clarify. I've got another one here, so I'll send this on to you. Hello, do you realize the pre op study with a CT scan or echography? We perform an echography in all patients. And if there is, uh, um, we see some kind of thrombosis or the diameter of the vessels, vessels is not very clear, we perform a, a CT scan and a, an a angio CT scan with a contrast to um, verify the, the caliber of the of the vessels. And there is if there is suspicious of thrombosis, as Maria Jose told in the in the in the webinar, we do a venography. But uh, our screening is with uh, only uh, a Doppler echography. Only in some cases we do CT scan. There is another question here. Maybe MRI? Well um, uh, we prefer uh, CT scan for the study of the vessels. Um, that's our choice. Uh, we do not uh, we do MRI for other type of patients, but in in transplantation we you we usually use CT scan as our preferred um, test. 
do you determine when a child can undergo a, a kidney transplant, surgical and urological? Uh, yeah, we we do that. Uh, we we have uh, um, always in in our hospital we make uh, the urological evaluation, um, uh, and when it's uh, okay, the, the urological evaluation uh, we. Uh, perform after that the transplantation and sometimes uh, most of the times we do the urological um, surgeries before to, to prepare the patient for the for the transplant we do the the bladder amputation or the mitrophanov or all the surgeries the patient needs so yeah normally the um, the patients hire are um, delivered to our to our hospital to do the the preparation Okay, uh, no other no, questions? No, no, no. One more, one, one second, Virginia. What? From Pim. One more question's come through from Pim. So, uh, yeah, okay. okay. Do you give? Uh, yes, we use, no, during the trust and surgery, no. We use heparin uh, most of the time, 24 hours after the transplantation. We evaluate the risk of, of bleeding uh, or thrombosis sometimes in some selected cases with uh, small vessels. We can start the heparin uh, a little bit um, earlier, but normally it's 24 hours after the transplantation. And um, uh, if the patient is bleeding, maybe we can delay the, 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 the administration of heparin to 40, uh, 48 hours or maybe three days, depending on the case. I don't know if there is more. Yeah, no, nothing else at the moment. So, uh, yeah, uh, Pim was saying thank you for the clear answers. Um, thank you for asking the questions, Pim, as well. Um, so, has anyone else got any questions they want to ask? Um, give you a few more seconds to do, uh, put them in if you if you do. Um, I'm trying to think. There's plenty of other stuff I should say, but I can't remember what it is right now. But uh, I think I would have eventually mentioned the website um, and the recordings. So. Um, yeah, so just give a few more seconds for people. Okay, the other thing I would say is everybody thinks of anything afterwards or anybody's watching this as recording, if you have questions, please, um, you should have uh, my contact details. So send the questions through to me and I can pass them on um, then for an answer uh, going forward. Um, you can also, I know some people leave comments in, in the YouTube videos as well which um, our business manager, Jen, will pick up on and read and uh, send on to those uh, in question as well. So that's another alternative uh, that you can use. Okay, we've got no other questions. So I'm gonna say that's probably it. So um, thank you very much, Virginia, for taking those questions and stepping in um, yeah. at quite short notice to do that. It's been very much appreciated. Part on our thanks also to Maria for doing the presentation as well as um, we're very thankful for all our centers uh, engaging with us on this on this program um thank you to all those who have attended um so please fill in your survey afterwards and if you have any um we do appreciate the feedback um i so say check out the website for our future sessions um and with that i will say i guess thank you to everybody and hope everyone has a good evening and i hope to see you all again soon for another webinar so thank you thank you bye Bye, everybody.